July. July 1st. The average man votes below himself. He votes with half a mind, or a hundredth part of one. A man ought to vote with the whole of himself, as he worships or gets married. A man ought to vote with his head and heart, his soul and stomach, his eye for faces and his ear for music. Also, when sufficiently provoked, with his hands and feet. If he has ever seen a fine sunset, the crimson color of it should creep into his vote. If he has ever heard splendid songs, they should be in his ears when he makes the mystical cross. But as it is, the difficulty with English democracy at all elections is that it is something less than itself. The question is not so much whether only a minority of the electorate votes. The point is that only a minority of the voter votes. Tremendous trifles. July 2nd. Modern masters of science are much impressed with the need of beginning all inquiry with a fact. The ancient masters of religion were quite equally impressed with that necessity. They began with the fact of sin, a fact as practical as potatoes. Whether or not man could be washed in miraculous waters, there was no doubt at any rate that he wanted washing. But certain religious leaders in London, not mere materialists, have begun in our day not to deny the highly disputable water, but to deny the indisputable dirt. Certain new theologians dispute original sin, which is the only part of Christian theology which can really be proved. Some followers of the Rev. R. J. Campbell, in their almost too fastidious spirituality, admit divine sinlessness which they cannot see even in their dreams but they essentially deny human sin, which they can see in the street. The strongest saints and the strongest skeptics alike took positive evil as the starting point of their argument. If it be true, as it certainly is, that a man can feel exquisite happiness in skinning a cat, then the religious philosopher can only draw one of two deductions. He must either deny the existence of God, as all atheists do, or he must deny the present union between God and man, as all Christians do. The new theologians seem to think it a highly rationalistic solution to deny the cat. Orthodoxy? July 3rd. The love of those whom we do not know is quite as eternally sentiment as the love of those whom we do know. In our friends the richness of life is proved to us by what we have gained. In the faces in the street the richness of life is proved to us by a hint of what we have lost. Robert Browning July 4th The old Anglo-American quarrel was much more fundamentally friendly than most Anglo-American alliances. Each nation understood the other enough to quarrel. In our time neither nation understands itself even enough to quarrel. Introduction to American Notes July 5th. It is the one great weakness of journalism as a picture of our modern existence that it must be a picture made up entirely of exceptions. We announce on flaring posters that a man has fallen off a scaffolding. We do not announce on flaring posters that a man has not fallen off a scaffolding. Yet this latter fact is fundamentally more exciting as indicating that the moving tower of terror and mystery, a man, is still abroad upon the earth. That the man has not fallen off a scaffolding is really more sensational, and it is also some thousand times more common. But journalism cannot reasonably be expected thus to insist upon the permanent miracles. Busy editors cannot be expected to put on their posters, Mr. Wilkinson still safe, or Mr. Jones of Worthing not dead yet. They cannot announce the happiness of mankind at all. They cannot describe all the forks that are not stolen or all the marriages that are not dissolved. Hence the complete picture they give of life is of necessity fallacious. They can only represent what is unusual. However democratic they may be, they are only concerned with the minority. The Ball and the Cross July 6th Happy who, like Ulysses, or that lord that raped the fleece, returning full and sage, with usage and the world's wide reason stored, with his own kin can wait the end of age. When shall I see, when shall I see, God knows, my little village smoke, 
or past the door, the old dear door of that unhappy house that is to me a kingdom and much more. Mightier to me the house my fathers made than your audacious heads, O halls of Rome, more than immortal marbles undecayed, the thin sad slates that cover up my home. More than your Tiber is my Loire to me, than Palatine my little lyre there, and more than all the winds of all the sea, the quiet kindness of the Angevin air. Translation from De Belay. July 7th. It is a great mistake to suppose that love unites and unifies men. Love diversifies them, because love is directed towards individuality. The thing that really unites men and makes them like to each other is hatred. Thus, for instance, the more we love Germany, the more pleased we shall be that Germany should be something different from ourselves, should keep her own ritual and conviviality and we ours. But the more we hate Germany, the more we shall copy German guns and German fortifications in order to be armed against Germany. The more modern nations detest each other, the more meekly they follow each other. For all competition is, in its nature, only a furious plagiarism. Charles Dickens July 8th The temporary decline of theology had involved the neglect of philosophy and all fine thinking, and Bernard Shaw had to find shaky justifications in Schopenhauer for the sons of God shouting for joy. He called it the will to live, a phrase invented by Prussian professors who would like to exist but can't. George Bernard Shaw July 9th there are only two kinds of social structure conceivable, personal government and impersonal government. If my anarchic friends will not have rules, they will have rulers. Preferring personal government with its tact and flexibility is called royalism. Preferring impersonal government with its dogmas and definitions is called republicanism. Objecting broad-mindedly both to kings and creeds is called bosh. At least I know no more philosophic word for it. What's wrong with the world? July 10th. Now, I have no particular objection to people who take the guilt off the gingerbread, if only for this excellent reason that I am much fonder of gingerbread than I am of guilt. But there are some objections to this task when it becomes a crusade or an obsession. One of them is this, that people who have really scraped the guilt off the gingerbread generally waste the rest of their lives in attempting to scrape the guilt off gigantic lumps of gold. Such has too often been the case for Shaw. He can, if he likes, scrape the romance off the armaments of Europe or the party system of Great Britain, but he cannot scrape the romance off love or military valor because it is all romance and three thousand miles thick. George Bernard Shaw July 11th The church is not a thing like the Athenaeum Club, he cried. If the Athenaeum Club lost all its members, the Athenaeum Club would dissolve and cease to exist. But when we belong to the church, we belong to something which is outside all of us, which is outside everything you talk about, outside the cardinals and the pope, they belong to it, but it does not belong to them. If we all fell dead suddenly, the church would somehow still exist in God. The Ball and the Cross July 12th Of all conceivable forms of enlightenment, the worst is what these people call the inner light. Of all horrible religions, the most horrible is the worship of the God within. Anyone who knows anybody knows how it would work. Anybody who knows anyone from the highest thought center knows how it would work. That Jones shall worship the God within him turns out ultimately to mean that Jones shall worship Jones. Let Jones worship the sun or moon, anything rather than the inner light. Let Jones worship cats or crocodiles, if he can find any in his street, but not the God within. Christianity came into the world firstly in order to assert with violence that a man has not only to look inwards, but to look outwards, to behold with astonishment and enthusiasm a divine company and a divine captain. The only fun of being a Christian was that a man was not left alone with the inner light, 
but definitely recognized in outer light, fair as the sun, clear as the moon, terrible as an army with banners. Orthodoxy. July 13th. The slum novelist gains his effects by describing the same gray mist as draping the dingy factory and the dingy tavern. But to the man he is supposed to be studying, there must be exactly the same difference between the factory and the tavern that there is to a middle-class man between a late night at the office and a supper at Pagani's. Heretics. July 14th. The Fall of the Bastille. The destruction of the Bastille was not a reform. It was something more important than a reform. It was an iconoclasm. It was the breaking of a stone image. The people saw the building like a giant looking at them with a score of eyes, and they struck at it as at a carved face. For of all the shapes in which that immense illusion, called materialism, can terrify the soul, perhaps the most oppressive is that of the big building. Man feels like a fly, an accident in the thing he has himself made. It requires a violent effort of the spirit to remember that man made this confounding thing, and man could unmake it. Therefore the mere act of the ragged people in the street taking and destroying a huge public building has a spiritual and a ritual meaning far beyond its immediate political results. It is a religious service. If, for instance, the socialists were numerous or courageous enough to capture and smash up the Bank of England, you might argue forever about the inutility of the act and how it really did not touch the root of the economic problem in the correct manner, but mankind would never forget it. It would change the world. Tremendous Trifles July 15th, St. Swithin's Day Only in our romantic country do you have the romantic thing called weather beautiful and changeable as a woman. The great English landscape painters, neglected now, like everything that is English, have this salient distinction that the weather is not the atmosphere of their pictures, it is the subject of their pictures. They paint portraits of the weather. The weather sat to Constable, the weather posed for Turner, and the deuce of a pose it was. In the English painters the climate is the hero. In the case of Turner, a swaggering and fighting hero, melodramatic but magnificent, the tall and terrible protagonist robed in rain, thunder, and sunlight, fills the whole canvas and the whole foreground. Rich colors actually looked more luminous on a gray day because they are seen against a dark background and seem to be burning with a luster of their own. Against a dim sky, all flowers look like fireworks. There is something strange about them, at once vivid and secret, like flowers traced in fire in the grim garden of a witch. A bright blue sky is necessarily the high light in the picture, and its brightness kills all the brave blue flowers. But on a gray day the larkspur looks like fallen heaven. The red daisies are really the lost red eyes of day, and the sunflower is the viced regent of the sun. Lastly, there is this value about the color that men call colorless, that it suggests in some way the mixed and troubled average of existence, especially in its quality of strife and expectation of promise. Gray is a color that always seems on the eve of changing to some other color, of brightening into blue or blanching into white or breaking into green or gold. So we may be perpetually reminded of the indefinite hope that is in doubt itself. And when there is gray weather on our hills or gray hair on our heads, perhaps they may remind us of the morning. Daily News July 16th It is true that all sensible women think all studious men mad. It is true, for the matter of that, all women of any kind think all men of any kind mad. But they do not put it in telegrams any more than they wire to you that grass is green or God all-merciful. These things are truisms and often private ones at that. The Club of Queer Trades July 17th You may come to think a blow bad because it humiliates. You may come to think murder wrong because it is violent and not because it is unjust. The Ball and the Cross July 18th Thackeray Born 
In all things his great spirit had the grandeur and the weakness which belonged to the England of his time, an England splendidly secure and free, and yet perhaps for that reason provincial and innocent. He had nothing of the doctrinal quality of the French and Germans. He was not one who made up his mind, but one who let his mind make him up. He lay naturally open to all noble influences flowing around him, but he never bestirred himself to seek those that were not flowing, or that flowed in opposite directions. Thus, for instance, he really loved liberty, as only a novelist can love it, a man mainly occupied with the variety and vivacity of men, but he could not see the cause of liberty except where the Victorian English saw it. He could not see it in the cause of Irish liberty, which was exactly like the cause of Polish or Italian liberty, except that it was led by much more religious and responsible men. And he made the Irish characters the object of much innocent and rather lumbering satire. But this was not his mistake, but the mistake of the atmosphere, and he was a sublime, emotional Englishman who lived by atmosphere. He was a great sensitive. The comparison between him and Dickens is commonly as clumsy and unreasonable as a comparison between Wilkie Collins and Charles Reed, or Bueller Lytton and Anthony Trollope. But the comparison really has this element of actuality, that Dickens was, above all things, creative. Thackeray was, above all things, receptive. There is no sense of talking about truth in the matter. Both are modes of truth. If you like to put it so, the world imposed on Thackeray, and Dickens imposed on the world. But it could be put more truly by saying that Thackeray represents in that gigantic parody called Genius the spirit of the Englishman in repose. This spirit is the idle embodiment of all of us. By his weaknesses we shall fail, and by his enormous sanities we shall endure. Introduction to Thackeray July 19th the Marchioness really has all the characteristics, the entirely heroic characteristics, which make a woman respected by a man. She is female, that is, she is at once incurably candid and incurably loyal. She is full of terrible common sense. She expects little pleasure for herself, and yet she can enjoy bursts of it. Above all, she is physically timid, and yet she can face anything. Introduction to The Old Curiosity Shop July 20th. Democracy in its human sense is not arbitrament by the majority. It is not even arbitrament by everybody. It can be more nearly defined as arbitrament by anybody. I mean that it rests on that club habit of taking a total stranger for granted, of assuming certain things to be inevitably common to yourself and him. Only the things that anybody may be presumed to hold have the full authority of democracy. Look out of the window and notice the first man who walks by. The liberals may have swept England with an overwhelming majority, but you would not stake a button that the man is a liberal. The Bible may be read in all schools and respected in all law courts, but you would not bet a straw that he believes in the Bible. But you would bet your week's wages, let us say, that he believes in wearing clothes. You would bet that he believes that physical courage is a fine thing or that parents have authority over children. Of course he might be the millionth man who does not believe these things. If it comes to that, he might be the bearded lady dressed up as a man. But these prodigies are quite a different thing from any mere calculation of numbers. People who hold these views are not a minority, but a monstrosity. But of these universal dogmas that have full democratic authority, the only test is this test of anybody. What you would observe before any newcomer in a tavern, that is the real English law. The first man you see from the window, he is the King of England. What's wrong with the world? July 21st. Many clever men like you have trusted to civilization. Many clever Babylonians, many clever Egyptians, many clever men at the end of Rome. Can you tell me, in a world that is flagrant with the failures of civilization, what there is particularly immortal about yours? The Napoleon of Notting Hill July 22nd It is a sufficient proof that we are not an essentially democratic state, that we are always wondering what we shall do with the poor. If we were Democrats, 
we should be wondering what the poor will do with us. With us the governing class is always saying to itself, what laws shall we make? In a purely democratic state it would always be saying, what laws can we obey? Heretics. July 23rd. No two ideals could be more opposite than a Christian saint in a Gothic cathedral and a Buddhist saint in a Chinese temple. The opposition exists at every point. But perhaps the shortest statement of it is that the Buddhist saint always has his eyes shut, while the Christian saint always has them very wide open. The Buddhist saint always has a very sleek and harmonious body, but his eyes are heavy and sealed with sleep. The medieval saint's body is wasted to its crazy bones, but his eyes are frightfully alive. There cannot be any real communion of spirit between forces that produce symbols so different as that. Granted that both images are extravagances or perversions of the pure creed, it must be a real divergence which could produce such opposite extravagances. The Buddhist is looking with particular intentness inwards. The Christian is staring with a frantic intentness outwards. Orthodoxy. July 24th. Novels and newspapers still talk of the English aristocracy that came over with William the Conqueror. Little of our effective oligarchy is as old as the Reformation, and none of it came over with William the Conqueror. Some of the older English landlords came over with William of Orange. The rest have come over by ordinary alien immigration. George Bernard Shaw July 25th It is the negation of property that the Duke of Sutherland should have all the farms in one estate, just as it would be the negation of marriage if he had all our wives in one harem. What's wrong with the world? July 26th Christianity is always out of fashion because it is always sane, and all fashions are mild insanities. When Italy is mad on art, the church seems too puritanical. When England is mad on puritanism, the church seems too artistic. When you quarrel with us now, you class us with kingship and despotism. But when you quarreled with us first, it was because we would not accept the divine despotism of Henry VIII. The church always seems to be behind the times, when it is really beyond the times. It is waiting till the last fad shall have seen its last summer. It keeps the key of a permanent virtue. The Ball and the Cross July 27th The best men of the Revolution were simply common men at their best. This is why our age can never understand Napoleon, because he was something great and triumphant. We suppose that he must have been something extraordinary, something inhuman. Some say he was the devil. Some say he was the superman. Was he a very, very bad man? Was he a good man with some greater moral code? We strive in vain to invent the mysteries behind that immortal mask of brass. The modern world, with all its subtleness, will never guess his strange secret. For his strange secret was that he was very like other people. Charles Dickens July 28th. The greatest disaster of the 19th century was this, that men began to use the word spiritual as the same as the word good. They thought that to grow in refinement and uncorporeality was to grow in virtue. When scientific evolution was announced, some feared that it would encourage mere animality. It did worse. It encouraged mere spirituality. It taught men to think that so long as they were passing from the ape, they were going. But you can pass from the ape and go to the devil. Orthodoxy. July 29th. One of the deepest and strangest of all human moods is the mood which will suddenly strike us perhaps in a garden at night or deep in sloping meadows. The feeling that every flower and leaf has just uttered something stupendously direct and important and that we have by a prodigy of imbecility not heard or understood it. There is a certain poetic value, and that a genuine one, in this sense of having missed the full meaning of things. There is beauty not only in wisdom, but in this dazed and dramatic ignorance. Robert Browning July 30th The authority of priests to absolve, the authority of popes to define, 
the authority even of inquisitors to terrify, these were all only dark defenses erected round one central authority, more undemonstrable, more supernatural than all the authority of a man to think. We know now that this is so. We have no excuse for not knowing it, for we can hear skepticism crashing through the old ring of authorities, and at the same moment we can see reason swaying upon her throne. Orthodoxy July 31st The party system in England is an enormous and most efficient machine for preventing political conflicts. George Bernard Shaw